All right. Hello, 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 class. Yes, I hope everybody is safe. Yes, sana naman safe po tayong lahat while watching this video. Okay, so for this video, I will be discussing about orientation. Okay, and then after which uh, we will be moving on to the different embedding molds that are utilized in histopath. And then uh, I will also be discussing microtomy, okay, as well as some of the procedures that we have to perform after sectioning, okay. So, yes, ito na. Um, I will give, for this video, I will give it as your quiz next meeting. Okay, so I will give this video as your quiz next meeting in the laboratory. Okay, but not in the lecture anymore. Alright, so let's start. Okay, so embedding, yes, this is one of the steps in which we have to perform proper orientation. Otherwise, okay, you will not get uh, the correct kind of section, okay, um, that the pathologist is supposed to uh, is supposed to evaluate uh, during microscopic examination. Okay, so that's why it's important that you have to properly orient your tissue sample. Okay. So when we say orientation, it takes place actually in three, okay, in three uh, different steps um, in tissue processing. So the first one, the first orientation that you have to uh, perform would be during embedding, okay? And I think this is part of activity uh, 2B. Okay, in which um, you were asked to uh, you were asked to to come up with illustrations or to to get images on how you are going to properly orient uh, the different kinds of tissue samples that we have in the laboratory. Like for example, if it's an epithelial surface, okay, or if it is a tubular structure, how are you going to orient it uh, during embedding? So during embedding, what we do is we arrange, okay, we arrange your tissue sample inside your mold so that you would be able to get the correct kind of section when you do microtomy later on. So say for example, if it's supposed to be cross-section, okay, if it's supposed to be a longitudinal section of your uh, tissue, it all depends on how you are going to orient it during embedding. Okay, it depends on how you are going to arrange your tissue sample inside your mold. All right, so that's the first embedding or orientation rather uh, that you have to perform. So we perform it during embedding. So arranging the tissue inside your mold, okay? Another uh, orientation that we have to perform is when you are going to fix your tissue block on your microtome. Okay, so again, it's very important also that you are able to orient your tissue block on your microtome when you do sectioning. So that means in addition to your embedding, okay, we also have to perform proper orientation during sectioning. Okay, so during sectioning, you are required to arrange your tissue block uh, on your block holder when you do your micro uh, microtomy or when you do your sectioning later on. Okay, so embedding, sectioning, and then lastly, okay, the last kind of orientation that you have to perform in tissue processing is when you arrange your tissue ribbons on the slide. So when, uh, when do we perform this? We perform this during fishing out, okay? During uh, the fishing out procedure uh, that you have to perform after flotation, okay? So I repeat, you have to properly arrange your tissue section or your tissue ribbons on your slide during fishing out. So during fishing out, so how 
are you supposed to arrange or what is this uh, particular arrangement that we are talking about. So say for example, this is your slide. Okay, so say for example, this is your slide. Yes, and then we have your tissue section. So your tissue section, it has to be parallel. Okay, so I repeat, it has to be parallel to the entire length of your glass light. Okay, so that is uh, the proper orientation of your tissue ribbons or your tissue sections on your slide during fishing out. So during fishing out, we can uh, make use of certain materials that we have in the laboratory in order for us to properly orient our tissue sections. The most common of which is, of course, we have your uh, we have your uh, your applicator sticks. Okay, so say for example, this is your say for example, this is your um, glass slide. Okay, so you are going to you are going to arrange. Okay, by by teasing, ganyan. So, kunwari, ito yung inyong applicator stick. So, pag, pag if you fish out mo, if you're going to fish out your sections, you have to make sure that it is parallel to the entire length of your uh, glass slide. Okay? And uh, the one, the material that we can use or one material that we can use in order to make or to guide your tissue section so that it will be parallel to your glass slide is your applicator stick. Okay? So you can also make use of other uh, other materials in the laboratory. Like for example, in my classes before when I handled histopath, so we make use of uh, the needle, okay? The needle of your uh, syringe, okay? Yan. So yun, yun sometimes yung ginag... Yun sometimes, okay? Yun minsan yung ginagamit namin, okay? In addition, of course, to your applicator stick, okay? So again, orientation is very important, yes? So that um, you would be able to get the correct type of section and uh, of course uh, the section that will help your pathologist in <clears throat> in making a uh, an accurate okay an accurate reading an accurate examination and of course interpretation of the patient's condition okay so in this different uh, steps in tissue processing uh, we perform orientation. So we have embedding, sectioning, and of course, during fishing out. All right. Yeah. So now let us move on to the different types of embedding molds. So again, this was part of your uh, activity that was given to you. Yes. Yeah. So you were supposed to uh, draw or to get images of the different embedding molds that we use in the laboratory. And of course, the paper book that I asked you to make individually. So it is a, an example of an embedding mold. Okay. So what are the different types of embedding molds that we can use in the laboratory? So the first one, we have your look hearts, uh, look hearts embedding mold. So your look hearts embedding mold, this is composed of <clears throat> two L-shaped heavy metals which are arranged on a flat, okay, or which are arranged flat on a metal surface. So these are the two L-shaped heavy metals. Okay, yan, dalawa sila. Two L-shaped heavy metals. Yes, that you can use uh, as part of your look hearts embedding mold. So the good thing about your look hearts embedding mold is that you can actually adjust. Okay, you can adjust your heavy metals, your L-shaped heavy metals, in order to fit the size of the specimen that you are going to embed. Okay, that you are going to embed. So that means whether your tissue sample is uh, big, medium, or small, so you can embed them or you can embed this kind of samples using your loop hearts embedding mold. Okay, so if, for example, it is big, then you can adjust. If it's small, then you can also adjust your heavy metals, okay, to fit 
the size of your specimen. So your Lucard's embedding mold, this is recommended for routine use, but not in laboratories with high workload. Why? <laughs> Why? Because um, you can only embed one, okay? One piece of tissue sample, okay? So one tissue sample per block or per mold. So that means if you have 10, okay, if you are going to embed 10 tissue samples, then you would need 10 Lucard's embedding molds also. Okay, so you can, you can only make use of one embedding mold for one tissue sample. So if your laboratory, say for example, handles um, maybe around 20 specimens per day, then, of course, okay, it's not practical to make use of your Lucard's embedding mold since you would need a lot of molds in older molds in, old, in older in order to embed all of these tissue samples that you receive in the laboratory. Okay, so yes, so it is recommended for routine use, but of course, it is not practical if your laboratory has a high workload. Okay, another kind of embedding mold that we can use is your compound embedding unit. So E here stands for embedding unit. Okay, so your compound embedding unit, unit so it contains several interlocking plates, okay, in which you are able to have several compartments also. So in your drawing, parang ganito siya. It looks like this, right? So it is uh, made up of several interlocking plates. Ah, uh, sorry. Several. Okay, several of the straight yan class, this is straight. These are straight lines. Okay, several interlocking plates. Okay, which now allows you to have several compartments. Okay, so that means you can embed one uh, tissue sample per compartment. So one for this, and then another for this one, this one, and then this one. Okay, so that means you have several molds. Okay, several uh, compartments rather, several compartments for each of your tissue sample. Okay, so that means also you are able to embed several specimens simultaneously. Okay, unlike in your Lucard's embedding mold, wherein you are only able to embed one tissue sample per loop heart. But for your compound embedding unit, okay, so this will allow uh, the embedding of several specimens simultaneously. So that means, okay, that means you can perform embedding even if your laboratory has a high workload. So your compound embedding unit actually allows us to reduce the workload or the time that it that it needs in order for us to embed several samples okay so i repeat uh, your compound embedding medium so it allows us to uh, embed several tissue samples simultaneously so that means okay for practicality's sake you can use it in laboratories with high workload okay ayan Kasi hindi mo na sila ulit-ulitin na or hindi mo na, uh, you will not be performing embedding several times. So you can perform it in, in just one go. Okay? Yes. With the use of your compound embedding unit. Alright? So another type of embedding molds that we can use in the laboratory are your disposable molds. Okay? So the first disposable mold that we have is your peel away and then we also have your plastic ice trays. And then lastly, we have your paper boats. Okay. So even if it says they're disposable molds, okay, in practice, um, hindi sila single use. Okay. So that means uh, laboratories would actually tend to uh, use them over and over again 
even if they are classified as disposable molds. They are not single use in practice. Okay? Yes. So, the first one, we have your peel away. Okay? So, ito. These are examples of your peel away. Okay? Peel away disposable molds. So, they are actually thin plastic embedding molds. And uh, the reason why we call it peel away is because of the fact that you can peel the sides once embedding is already complete. Okay, so you can peel the sides of your embedding mold once the procedure is already complete. So the good thing about your peel away disposable molds is that they provide perfectly even blocks. So that means even if you do not perform trimming, so you can already proceed to sectioning, okay? Even without performing trimming because your blocks um, are already even, okay? They are perfectly even already. So you can uh, directly proceed to sectioning even without trimming, okay? And then the next one, we have your plastic ice trays. So just like what I have mentioned before, when we say plastic ice trays, um, this refers to the ice trays that we use to make your ice cubes at home. So ganun, at home. <laughs> so ganun talaga yung itsura niya, okay? So that is how your plastic ice trays look like. Yes, your plastic ice trays, they are recommended for BC routine laboratories. Yes. Why? Because just like for your, uh, just like for your compound embedding unit, your plastic ice trays actually provide several compartments for your tissue samples. Okay, so if you have, uh, if you have seen a plastic ice tray before, so di ba ganyan ang itsura niya? It looks like this. Okay, so you have several compartments. Okay, so you have several compartments for each of your tissue. Okay, for each of your tissue sample. So that means you are also able to uh, embed several tissue samples simultaneously. Okay, so that's why it is recommended for BC routine laboratories. Okay, so the only um, problem that we can, uh, we, we, we may, okay, we may encounter with the use of your plastic ice trays is that it is quite difficult to uh, remove your blocks once embedding is already complete. So in order to facilitate the removal of your, uh, of your blocks, okay, of your tissue blocks from your plastic ice trays, you have to smear the inner portion of your plastic ice trays with glycerin or liquid paraffin before embedding. So I repeat, uh, in order for us to facilitate the removal of your uh, blocks from your plastic ice trays, you have to smear the inner portion of your plastic ice trays with glycerin or you can also make use of your liquid paraffin before embedding, okay, before embedding. So this will now allow us to remove your tissue block more easily after embedding is complete, okay, yes. So another type of disposable mold that we can use in the laboratory are your paper boats, okay? And in the Philippines, yes, particularly in uh, yung hindi masyadong high-end na laboratories, so we make use of your paper boats. Why? Because they are economical for the laboratory. Yes, they are cheap, they are economical. So they can also be, uh, they can be made, okay, with different sizes. And of course, since we are able to, since we are able to label each of your paper boat, so this will now avoid confusion, okay? Yes, because you are able to label each of your block. All right, so you have already experienced making your own paper boats, okay? So your paper boats actually, uh, theoretically, they are, uh, they are usually for, they are commonly recommended for celloidine blocks, okay? But in practice, they are also used for paraffin blocks, okay? So they are cheap and easy to make. Yes, yes, cheap and easy to make. 
And of course, just like what I have mentioned, so easy and accurate identification of your specimen is possible since you are able to label each of your paper boats. Okay, each of your paper, paper boats. Yes, and you can uh, make it to suit any to suit any uh, tissue size. All right. Yes. Actually, in the laboratory, uh, even if your paper boats are considered to be disposable molds, yes, inuulit ulit din po ang mga paper boats sa laboratory. Okay. I don't know why. Mahal ba ang ano? <laughs> Mahal ba ang index card? But anyway, siguro it's it's a means. Uh, for the procedure to, it's a way for the procedure to be more economical for the laboratory, okay? But that is what we do in the laboratory, really. So even your paper boats are not considered to be single use, okay? So they are used uh, several times in the laboratory, all right? Yes, yes, okay, so those are the different, yes, those are the different uh, disposable molds that we can use in histopath, okay, yes, so ganyan yung ginawa ninyo nung doon sa pinagawa ko, alright, and then the last one, this one is not, uh, this one, okay, um, I, um, this one, um, okay, ito, uh, tinagalog ko lang, okay. So, this kind of embedding mold is the one uh, which was or which is shown in the videos that I have asked you to watch. Okay, so as you can see in the videos, okay, um, the, the laboratory made use of your plastic embedding rings and base molds, okay? Yes, so this is actually composed of a special stainless steel base mold that is fitted with a plastic embedding ring. Okay, with the plastic embedding ring. So after the embedding procedure, you are you would have this kind of block. Okay, yeah. So you would have that kind of block. A special stainless steel base mold. So we have it here with a plastic embedding ring. Okay, with the plastic embedding ring. So the good thing about your plastic embedding ring is that it can serve as the block holder during sectioning. Okay, so it can serve as the uh, the back holder during sectioning. So a good example of a plastic embedding ring uh, with this mold is your tissue tech system. Okay, so this is a good example of this kind of embedding mold. All right, and the good thing about your tissue tech system is that you don't have to immerse your block in uh, cold water or you don't need to refrigerate it. Why? Because your tissue tech system contains a cold plate at the bottom. Okay, so it contains a cold plate at the bottom, which is maintained at a negative 5 degrees Celsius temperature. So I repeat, your cold plate, it is maintained at negative 5 degrees Celsius. All right, yes. So that's why... Um, in high-end laboratories, okay, in high-end laboratories, so they prefer making use of your plastic embedding ring and your base molds, okay? Why? Why? Because they are easy to use and as you can see, less paraffin is needed in order for you to uh, perform the embedding procedure. It, uh, it is considered to be a faster uh, embedding procedure, okay? And of course, it will be easier for you to orient your tissue block in your microtome later on. So apart from that, okay, apart from that, as you can see here, your uh, plastic or your base, yes, your plastic ring, your plastic embedding ring, provides permanent identification. So you can already write here the identification number of your tissue block. Okay, yes. So those are the different embedding molds that molds molds that we use in histopath. All right. So how do we perform your embedding procedure exactly? So depending upon the kind of embedding procedure that we are to perform, Okay, so it entails uh, different steps. So the first one, we have our paraffin method. So for our paraffin method, 
Okay? So, if for example, this is the bit, this is your, yan. So, if that is your mold, and usually, just like what I have mentioned, we make use of your paper boat. So, you have to, saglit, put the dough niya ko. Okay, so say for example, this is your embedding mold. Okay, yes, dapat straight yun na. Yes, you have to mark the bottom of your embedding mold with an X. Okay, so that you would know which surface is supposed to go into your black holder later on. So this X mark, you have to make use of a pencil, uh, of a pencil to mark it with an X. Okay, mark the bottom of your, uh, of your uh, mold with an X. Okay, so that you know that that surface uh, should be used for cutting when you perform sectioning later on. Okay, yes. So after which you are going to pour your melted paraffin. You are going to pour your melted paraffin, okay? A little bit of your melted paraffin. And then after that, you orient your tissue sample. And then pour again your melted paraffin until such time that it reaches the highest possible uh, portion of your tissue block, okay? Or of your tissue mold or your embedding mold. Okay, so after that, you have to cool it at negative 5 degrees Celsius or immerse it in cold water. So this will uh, facilitate more, a more rapid, okay, a more rapid uh, embedding procedure. And of course, it will also ensure that your tissue block is really hard. Okay, yes, that your tissue block has hardened adequately already. Right, so yeah. So another uh, procedure that we can perform is your celloidine or your nitrocellulose method. So in this case, we embed the tissue in shallow tins of enamel pans. Yes, and then you have to cover it with sheets of weighted glass. So remember that for celloidine, the embedding procedure has to take place gradually. Okay, why? Because the solidification of your celloidine, remember, is via the evaporation of your solvents. And you have to evaporate your solvents gradually because, okay, if you are going to allow it to harden or to solidify rapidly, so this will now cause bubble formation in your celloidine block. Okay, so that why, that's why that why that's why it has to be gradual. All right, yes. However, nowadays, um, since we already know uh, the different hazards which are associated with the use of your celloidine, the use of your celloidine in the laboratory is discouraged. Okay, yes, it is discouraged. So that means it only has a limited use in the laboratory. Okay, because you need to make use of ether in order to dissolve your celloidine. And we all know that ether is quite dangerous, okay, for the laboratory, okay, or for laboratories. All right, so the last kind of embedding procedure that we will be discussing is your double embedding procedure. Okay, yes. The next one, we have your double embedding procedure. Okay, so in your double embedding procedure, um, this involves infiltration of your tissue sample with celloidine, and then after which you are going to embed it in paraffin. Okay, so <clears throat> previously, the uh, application of double embedding is in order for us to facilitate the sectioning of large blocks. Okay, particularly if you are, uh, if you are performing uh, or if you are processing vein samples. Okay, yes. So, uh, double embedding is utilized to facilitate sectioning of large blocks of dense, firm tissues, just like your brain samples. Okay, your double embedding before it was also recommended for small sections. Okay. However, we do not utilize double embedding procedure nowadays. Okay. Yes. It, this kind of procedure is already considered as obsolete. Why? Because there are already a lot of available media that 
can, okay, that can substitute for your double embedding procedure. Okay, yeah. So those are uh, the procedures that we can perform for embedding. Okay, so now let us move on to uh, sectioning, which is the next step in tissue processing. Yes, sectioning or microtomy. Okay, yes, sectioning or microtomy. So this illustration, this is the kind of microtome that we use in the laboratory. So specifically, this is actually, uh, specifically, this is actually a rotary microtome. Okay, yes. So we have here your knife. Okay, ito yung knife natin. And then we have here your block. All right, yes. So what is microtomy? So microtomy, this is otherwise referred to as your sectioning. Okay, yes, this is otherwise referred to as your sectioning. I think the term sectioning is more um, popular, right? We are more, uh, we are more um, familiar with the term sectioning uh, as compared to the term microtomy, okay? But both of them refer to the same procedure in tissue processing. So what is microtomy or sectioning? Okay, so this involves um, the trimming, okay? The trimming and cutting of a process tissue. So that means uh, the process tissue that we are talking about here is actually your tissue block, okay? So your tissue block is trimmed and cut into uniformly thin slices or sections, okay? Yes, when we say tissue section, we are referring to the thin slices already. So that's why if you go back to your, uh, your first activity in histopath, okay? So I have uh, commented uh, some items which made use of the term tissue section. Because tissue section is different from your tissue sample, okay? When we say tissue section, these are the thin slices already, which are produced during microtomy or sectioning, okay? So the tissue block that is commonly sectioned in the laboratory are, of course, your paraffin blocks, okay? So I repeat, the uh, commonly sectioned block in the laboratory would, of course, be your paraffin embedded blocks. Okay, so we have here a diagram. So this is your tissue section or your tissue ribbon. Okay, yes, that is produced um, when we cut your tissue block using your microtome knife. All right, so ganyan siya. All right, yes. All right, all right. All right, so, all right, all right, and a man. <laughs> all right, so what are the different parts of your microtome? So basically, your microtome has three basic parts. So we have here your block holder, yes. So what is the function of your block holder? Your block holder is where your tissue is held in a position. So you have to make sure that your block is not moving. It has to be firmly fixed in your block holder. Otherwise, you will not be able to produce your tissue sections. Okay, so that's your block holder. So another, we also have here your knife holder or knife carrier, okay, plus your knife, of course. So your knife carrier and your knife, so they are the ones uh, that performs the actual cutting of your tissue sections. Okay, so I repeat, these are the uh, parts that perform the actual cutting of your tissue sections. Okay, and of course, the others, we have, we have all of them located here. Okay, so what are the other parts? We have your pole. I think all of these are in your module. Your pole, your ratchet feed wheel, and of course, your adjustment screws. So the the function of these other parts of your microtome is to line up your tissue block in proper position with your knife. Okay, And of course, we also use them to adjust the thickness of the tissue sections that are produced. Okay, So that's why they are, uh, they are also considered as basic parts of your 
microtome. Okay, yeah. So those are the different parts of your microtome. And what is the principle of your uh, microtomy? So the, uh, regardless of the type of microtome that we are talking about, we have the same principle. Okay, and the principle is a spring balance teeth, otherwise referred to as your pole. So it's brought in contact with and turns a ratchet feed wheel that is connected to your micrometer screw, which is in turn rotated, moving the tissue block at a predetermined uh, distance towards the knife for cutting sections at uniform thickness. Okay, so to um to to, to discuss this in a more simple manner. So say, for example, this is your tissue block, okay? And then this is your knife. So your pole, your ratchet feed wheel, as well as your micrometer screw, di ba ang sabi ko kanina, they are supposed to align your tissue block to your knife, okay? To your knife so that you would be able to make sections. Okay, so if you move, if you move your, uh, your, uh, your, your, if you are going to move your ratchet feed wheel, okay, what will happen is that it will, okay, your tissue block will move towards your knife, okay, yes, it will move towards your knife. And then, yung movement niya is, um, it actually depends on the microtome, but usually, it, it moves in a vertical manner. So, say for example, this is your, this is your uh, tissue block, okay? So, it will move like this, ganyan, ganyan. So, it moves at a predetermined, it, it moves at a predetermined um, distance, okay? Predetermined distance towards your knife. And as, as it moves towards your knife, and when it makes contact with your knife, that is when your tissue sections are produced or your tissue ribbons are produced. Okay? Basta pa ganyan siya. Ching, 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 ching. Okay? Yes. Alright? And then after that, you will now have your tissue ribbons. Okay? Yes. So if it's, uh, kasi medyo mahirap i-imagine siya. Uh, you might want to um to to watch again the videos that I have shared in which the histotechnologist is performing sectioning. Okay, so that you would be able to imagine how your microtome works. Okay, ayan. So the 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 equipment, okay, or the instrument that we use in order for us to perform microtomy is of course your microtome. Okay, yes, your microtome. Yes, all right. And we have different types of microtome in the laboratory. Yes. So the first microtome that we will be discussing is your rocking, otherwise referred to as your Cambridge microtome. Okay, so your uh, rocking or your Cambridge microtome. So this was invented in 1881 by Paldwell Trefall. Okay, by Paldwell Trefall. Uh, your rocking microtome, this is considered to be the simplest microtome that we have in the laboratory, okay? And it is composed of a heavy base. Yes, it is composed of basic parts of your rocking microtome. It is composed of a heavy base, okay? So this is the heavy base that we are talking about. And it has two arms, okay? It has two arms. So the upper arm and the lower arm all right so your uh, rocking or your cambridge microtome is available in two sizes we have your small and your large rocking microtome in um this sizes of your rocking microtome um suits okay two kind of two kind two kinds of paraffin embedded blocks also we have your small and of course your large paraffin embedded blocks Okay, so I repeat, it is available in two sizes to suit the size also of the paraffin embedded blocks that we are able to produce in the laboratory. Okay, so what are the disadvantages of your rocking microtome? So number one, it cannot, theoretically, ha, theoretically speaking, it should not be used for serial sections. Why? Because the sections are cut in a slightly curved plane. 
Okay, remember that um, the, the plane of cutting, okay, the plane of cutting, it has to be flat. Okay, it can, it can be vertical, okay, it can be vertical, but it has to be flat. So vertical, flat plane, or it can also be on a horizontal flat plane. Okay, yes. However, in the case of your, in the case of your rocking microtome, it is in a slightly curved plane. So that means your block moves like this. Hindi siya flat. Okay, so it moves in a slightly curved plane. So that's why, theoretically speaking also, your rocking microtome is not used for serial sections. Okay, serial sections. Yes, apart from that, another disadvantage of your rocking microtome is that there are restrictions when it comes to the size of the block. Why? Because, katulad niya ng sinabi ko, uh, since your racking microtomes are available in two sizes, right? So we have your small and your large racking microtome. So if your uh, tissue block is small, you can only make use of your small racking microtome. You cannot make use of your large racking microtome. Okay? And the same is true when you, you have a large block. If you have a large block, you cannot make use of your small rocking microtome. Okay, so there are restrictions when it comes to the size of your block. Okay, yes. So apart from that, it is quite difficult to orient your tissue block. Okay, it is quite difficult to orient your tissue block in your tissue holder. Okay, yes. So that is another disadvantage. All right. So as for the size of uh, sections which are produced, we are able to produce sections with a thickness of 10 to 12 micrometers. Okay, so 10 to 12 micrometers or micra. All right, so those are the different characteristics of your rocking microtome. Okay, so now let us move on to your rotary microtome. So your rotary microtome, so this was invented by Minot, okay? Or if you want, you can pronounce it as Minot, Minot, okay? Minot or Minot, yes. So this was invented sometime uh, between 1885 to 1886. So your ro rotary microtome, this is considered to be the most common type of microtome that is used for both your routine and your research laboratories. Okay, so I repeat, it is the most common type of microtome for both your routine and research laboratories. Okay, yes. And the good thing about your rotary microtome is that it, uh, it is available or uh, we have manual, Okay, we have manual uh, rotary microtomes and we also have electrically driven rotary microtomes. Okay, so both manual and electrically driven rotary microtomes are available for use. Yes, so your rotary microtome, it is used to produce, it is commonly used to produce your paraffin embedded sections. Okay, and one advantage is that um, the tissue block moves in an up and down vertical movement, which now creates a perfectly flat plane for your tissue sections or your tissue ribbons. Okay, so that's why your rotary microtome, this is considered to be ideal, okay, ideal for excellent serial sections. Yes, so it is ideal for excellent serial sections because you are able to, uh, to, to make your knife and your block parallel with each other. So that means the plane of cutting that you are able to produce when you uh, make use of your rotary microtome is considered to be perfectly flat. Okay, yes, it is perfectly flat because the knife and the block are parallel with each other. 
Yes, creating now a perfectly flat plane, which is ideal for excellent serial sections. All right, yes. So as compared to your uh, rocking microtome, your rotary microtome is considered to be heavier and more stable. So that means your rotary microtome is more complex both in design and construction as compared to your rot uh, as compared to your rocking microtome. Okay? So the only disadvantage of your rotary, okay, rotary microtome as compared to your rocking microtome is that the blade, okay, your microtome knife, your knife Okay, the blade of your knife is in an upward position. So that means it is more dangerous as compared to your rocking microtome. Okay, so actually it's really very dangerous. Yes, I have been cut several times. Yes, I have been cut. I have been injured several times um, by the microtome that we have in the laboratory. And ang nakakatakot doon, yes, ang nakakatakot doon, what's more uh, frightening is that uh, the blade that we use in school, okay, the disposable blades which are incorporated in your microtome knife, they are super duper, um, ano yun? Matalim in English. They are super duper sharp. So sharp that you don't even uh, that you don't even feel the cut. Yes, that's how sharp they are. Yes, natatanggal na yung finger mo na babawasan na hindi mo pa alam. Yes, I have encountered uh, students who who were injured during sectioning before. Yes, I think one student even had to uh, go to the clinic. Uh, yes, and had several stitches. Yes, Ugh. okay, had several stitches. Uh, but uh, fortunately, in my case, it's uh, the cuts are usually not very, uh, not very serious. Okay, but yeah, yeah, uh, it's a little bit dangerous to perform sectioning or microtomy. So that's why I always make sure that I am there. Uh, to guide my students during microtomy or sectioning. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, naka, naka pass kasi yung blade, which makes it more dangerous. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, the good thing about the rotary microtome is that it can be adjusted. Okay. It can be adjusted to suit the size of your uh, of your block or your tissue. So this is your block holder. So depending on the size of your depending on the size of your uh, tissue sample or your tissue block rather, you can actually adjust the size. Okay, yes. So you can use your rotary microtome for large blocks. You can also use it for small blocks. Okay, yes. So your rotary microtome may be used for cutting large blocks. Although in the laboratory, large blocks are usually uh, sectioned, okay, are usually sectioned uh, using your sliding microtome. Okay, yeah. Yes. So as you can see here, your rotary microtome is able to produce sections which are 4 to 6 micrometers in thickness. So that means, okay, that means your rotary microtome is, yes, the one that we use for routine sectioning. Because again, what is the requirement? What is the requirement for uh, routine examination of your histologic slides or histopath slides? We have four to six micrometers. Okay, so that is the required thickness of your six sections. <laughs> okay, that is the required thickness of your sections of your sections for routine study. Okay, for routine study, we have four to six micrometers. So that's why the routinely used microtome in the laboratory is your rotary microtome. Okay, and do not forget class that your rotary microtome 
this is the one that is incorporated in your triostat. Okay, so do not forget that uh, uh, the kind of microtome that is incorporated in your cryostat is your rotary microtome. Okay, yes. Yeah. So your rotary microtome can actually be used for cryostat and for ultra thin sections also. Okay, for light microscopy. All right, so that is for your rotary microtome. So now let us move on to the next one. We have your sliding microtome. Uh, your sliding microtome, this was the first kind of microtome uh, that was invented in 1789. And uh, it was invented by Adams. Yes, wag niyong kakalimutan yung mga inventors ha. Lagi pong tinatanong yan sa board exam. Okay, so let's start with rocking. Rocking or Cambridge microtome, Caldwell Trifold. Uh, rotary microtome, Minot. Okay, sliding microtome, we have Adams. Okay, we have Adams. Ayan. So this was the first microtome which was invented. And the thickness of sections, uh, we have four to nine micrometers. Okay, there are actually two types of sliding microtomes. We have your standard sliding microtome. And then the other one is your base sledge microtome. Okay, so standard sliding microtome and then the base sledge microtome. All right, so your standard sliding microtome, it is actually a very unique type of microtome. Why? Because, okay, why? Because, diba, in the other microtomes that we have, your knife remains stationary. Okay, your knife is the one that is stationary. And then the block is the one that moves towards your knife. Okay, but in the case of your standard sliding microtome, in the case of your standard sliding microtome, it is your knife that moves toward your towards your block. Okay, so it moves in a horizontal manner. So that means your block. It remains stationary and your knife is moved backward or forward and backward. So, pag ganyan siya. So, from this, mag-i-slide siya. Kaya nga siya tinawag na sliding. Okay? So, it, it slides horizontally. Click lang. Okay, it moves horizontally. So your knife moves horizontally forward and back, backward towards your uh, block holder or towards your block. So pag ganyan siya. Chung, 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 chung. Okay? nag slide siya. Kaya nga ang tawag sa kanya ay sliding microtome. Okay, so the knife is the one that is moving. So that's why your standard sliding microtome is considered to be the most dangerous. Why? Because the knife is the one that is moving. So that's why, okay, that's why you have to be very careful when you are using your standard sliding microtome in the laboratory. Okay, in the laboratory because it is considered to be the most dangerous. Okay, so you have to perform sectioning in a slow but very steady motion. Okay, so that uh, you would be able to protect yourself from any injury. Okay, from any injury um, associated with the use of your standard sliding microtome. Okay, yes. All right. So your standard sliding microtome, this is utilized for celloidine embedded tissue sections. Yes, for your uh, for celloidine embedded tissue sections. Okay, and then the other type of sliding microtome, we have your base sledge microtome. Okay, so for this one, okay, for this one, um, uh, the block holder is the one that moves under your knife. So this one is your block holder, okay? And then we have here your knife that is positioned downwards. Pag siya. 
okay, that is positioned downwards. And so your black holder, okay, is the one which will move under your knife. So this is the one that you are going to hold. Okay, so parang dyan mo siya hawakan. Ako ganyan ka dyan. And then you are going to slide. Okay, you are going to slide your back holder under your knife so that you will have your sections. Okay, so your base ledge uh, sliding microtome, it is actually favored for very hard tissue or for large blocks. Okay, yes, so it is utilized for hard and tough tissue blocks in all forms of media. Yes, yes, particularly if you are, uh, if you are sectioning tough tissue blocks. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> since, uh, since it can be utilized for hard tissue blocks, your base ledge sliding microtome, it is actually ideal for resin embedded. Okay, it is ideal for resin embedded decalcified bone. So remember that for the, uh, for, for the, uh, for, ano tag dun? for high resolution light microscopy, Okay, of your decalcified bone samples, you can actually make use of your acrylic plastic. Okay, so if you make use of your acrylic plastic for embedding of your decalcified bone samples, actually, pwede nga siya for undecalcified, di ba? Yes. Um, you can make use of your base sledge sliding microtome. Okay, yes. You can make use of your base sledge sliding microtome. Right. And for next, and for next, <laughs> yes, ano ba to? second to the last microtome. Okay, so we have your ultra thin microtome. Uh, for your ultra thin microtome, this from the term itself, ultra thin. Okay, so this is utilized for electron microscopy. Yes, and the specimens, uh, of course, they have to be processed for electron microscopy. So for your ultra thin microtome, you are able to produce sections which are very thin. So we have 0 0.5 micrometers, okay, or micrometer, 0 0.5 micrometer. So your ultra thin microtome is used in conjunction with your uh, special knives, okay, for uh, in conjunction with your special knives okay so it um your ultra thin microtome in particular uses broken plate glass knives okay yes so it uses broken plate glass knives for ultra uh, for electron microscopy okay and the last microtome that we have in the laboratory is your freezing microtome so this was invented in 1848 by Quecket. yes and um uh, we cut undehydrated tissues in frozen state. So your freezing microtome is one of the uh, one of the instruments that we can use in the laboratory to produce your frozen sections along with your cryostat. So in particular, it is utilized for fats and tissue constituents that may be damaged by uh, the routine paraffin processing that we perform in the laboratory. So the thickness of sections that you are able to produce is at 10 to 15 micrometers. Okay, it is at 10 to 15 micrometers. So this is the kind of freezing microtome that we use in the laboratory. So as you can see, it contains a stage. Okay, the stage is hollow and perforated, which is attached to a pipe. Okay, so this is the pipe that is attached to your stage. So the purpose of your pipe is to uh, provide the carbon dioxide that is needed to freeze your black holder as well as your tissue sample evenly. Okay, yes. And apart from that, there is a second cooling device for your knife. Okay, for your knife. So the uh, the one thing that you have to remember when you perform sectioning using your freezing microtome is that, okay, always remember that your block, okay, your block holder, your block holder, 
your tissue block, okay, your tissue block, as well as your knife, they have to have approximately the same temperature, okay? So they have to have approximately the same temperature, okay? Otherwise, you will not be able to uh, make your tissue sections if they have different, okay, if they have different temperatures. Okay, yeah. So additional purpose of your freezing microtome apart from uh, sectioning of fats, okay, it, it, um, your freezing microtome can also be used for, uh, for rapid diagnosis of your tissue sample, for neurological tissue samples, which actually requires thicker sections, and of course, for heat-sensitive tissue constituents. Okay, so again, may I just uh, emphasize that your freezing microtome is different from your cryostat or cold microtome. All right, your freezing microtome class, your freezing microtome, this is otherwise referred to as your cold knife. Okay, your cold knife or your freezing microtome. Your cryostat, on the other hand, your cryostat, cryostat. So this is otherwise referred to as your cold microtome, okay, which is different from your freezing microtome. So again, what microtome is incorporated inside your cryostat? Okay, yes, very good. We have your rotary microtome. So that means your cryostat is actually able to produce sections which are thinner as compared to your freezing microtome. So that's why for routine, okay, for routine uh, frozen sections, for routine frozen sections, what equipment do we use? We make use of your cryostat. Okay, because it is able to satisfy the required thickness for routine examination, and that is four to six micrometers, as compared to the thickness of sections which are produced by your freezing microtome. Okay, yes, yes. So your cryostats, it provides a means in order for us to prepare thin frozen sections. So as thin as four micrometers. So your cryostat, okay, your cryostat, um, this is actually utilized in conjunction with fluorescent antibody staining. Okay, we have fluorescent antibody staining or even your histo chemical studies, okay, histochemical enzyme studies. Yes. Yung sa freezing microtome kasi, the sections are too thick, okay, are too thick. So that's why if you are going to produce fluorescent antibody staining or histochemical enzyme studies, you make use of your cryostat, okay, to produce thin frozen sections. So this is the most commonly used for rapid preparation of urgent uh, tissue biopsies for intraoperative diagnosis. Oh, ang haba, no? Okay, Mo most, ano ba, ma'am? Okay, most commonly used for rapid preparation, okay, of urgent um, biopsies, of urgent biopsies particularly if we are considering your intraoperative diagnosis. Okay, so class, ano ang ibig sabihin ng intraoperative diagnosis? So it means that you have to prepare, you have to process, okay, your sections during an operation or during or while a surgery or while an operation is taking place. Okay, yes. So like for example, if the doctor wants to know if, uh, if um, there is a need for him or her to remove a particular tissue or a particular organ from uh, the patient during surgery or during operation, we make use of your cryostat to help, okay, to help that particular surgeon. Ayan. So that's why 
in some of the hospitals that we have, usually yung surgery room or yung operation room, may katabi siyang cryostat room. Okay, yes. May, meron usually yan na katabi na cryostat room. Why? Yes, to provide intraoperative diagnosis. So if, for example, the surgeon wants to consult the pathologist and... Um, of course, the consultation is oftentimes immediate, diba? It, it is, the consultation is oftentimes urgent, okay? So, alangan naman na from the operation room or operation room, from the operating room, pupunta ka pa doon sa lab, pupunta ka pa sa histopath section, okay? Hindi na, kasi dapat meron ng cryostat na malapit doon sa operating room natin, okay? Yes, so the cryostat will serve for intraoperative diagnosis in order to help the surgeon know what to do during surgery or during an operation. Okay, so it is located close to your operating room which will allow direct consultation between your surgeon and your pathologist. Okay, yeah. So cryostat po ha in the freezing cryostats. Okay? Yes, yeah, so those are the different kinds of microtome that we have in the laboratory. So I will end my video presentation here and then for the next video that I will be uploading, I will be discussing about the different kinds of microtome knives. Okay? Different kinds of microtome knives that we use in the laboratory. Okay? So again, I hope everyone is safe. Yes, and I'll see you again in my next video. Bye. Bye. Bye.